what we're going to talk about, which is about basically we're going to talk about Churchill, but we're not going to talk about Churchill. No. Well, we will talk about Churchill, but we're not going to be talking solely about Churchill because that's been done um, a lot. In fact, it's been done a lot very recently. That's kind of why we're we're uh, traveling into again, this. Please? Pardon? Could you hit that again, please? I'm yeah. sorry. Little technical things. We're trying something new here. So one of the things that we're trying to talk about is how history looks at a character. Right. Or a character. Well, not a character, but a, a historical person. Right, okay. And how basically more than just who that person is, but how history re remembers that person. Because that's kind of a different subject. Uh, you can think about basically the biography of a person. And what we'll get into tonight is the idea that there's more than one way to tell a story and there's more than one person telling that story. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right into sure. an example, okay? We're gonna talk about a gentleman by the name of Scott Kelly, who has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do, with seemingly- With Winston Churchill, except that, that- In October of last year, he made this statement. He sent out a tweet. One of the greatest leaders in modern times, Sir Winston Churchill said, in victory magnanimity, I guess those days are over. I don't actually know the context in which he was saying this. But what's interesting is the response that he got. He was immediately attacked for a number of things, uh, for praising Churchill, when he's kind of controversial. And he, hours later, sent out this addendum. Did not mean to offend by quoting Churchill. My apologies. I will go and educate myself further on his atrocities, racist views, which I do not support. My point was we need to come together as a nation. We are all Americans, which Churchill wasn't, and that should transcend partisan politics. He was half American. Yes, he, his mother was American. His mother was American. But that uh, that initial quote by Scott Kelly, and then when he came back to speak, and he talked about, I need to go educate myself, that's what a scientist would say. A or, scientist, an or an astronaut. Or an astronaut. Someone, you know, someone points out they're wrong, and they're going to say, oh, you're right. But I should he, ed educate myself. But if he thought he was attacked for praising Churchill. It did not compare to the way he was attacked for questioning that praise. Right. Here's a couple of, of front pages from a couple of, uh, these are British newspapers. He was actually attacked on Fox News, on most channels. Bill Maher ran a scree against him. All sorts of people basically said, how dare you apologize for speaking well of Churchill? Now, again, going back to his original statements, I thought he was pretty spot on to say, we need to try to come together. Right. And that he was basing that on the public image that everybody has of Churchill. Mm -hmm. You know, atrocities is a judgment call. Mm -hmm. Calling Churchill a racist is not. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and, and we can get into that and you can say, well, he was a product of his times, but uh, people don't even buy that. Uh, right. A lot of people at the time said he was pretty strong for his time. So what we wanted to look into was the controversy, was why would be people be... Uh, on one side saying he shouldn't have said those nice things about Winston Churchill, and on the other side saying you shouldn't have apologized for saying nice things about Winston Churchill. And just so you know, we are not going to end the question, was he a hero or a villain? Nope. We don't know. We did try that. We argued for a while. Yep. There's still some holes in the ceiling where you threw that frying pan <laughs> at me. Uh, there was yeah. an issue. But that's not what we're here to talk about. No. It'll come up. You can form your own opinion. There's enough facts on both sides. Um, and I think coming out of here, if you have a little bit better idea about what historians do, about what history means, about what how we use history, um, I think that's going to be a worthwhile hour. Two weeks ago, John McDonnell, who is the mm -hmm. shadow chancellor of the Exchequer of Great Britain, was told, give me a one, this is in an interview, give me a one word answer. Winston Churchill, hero or villain? And his answer was? His answer was two words. He said, Tony Pandy, which was one particular incident, villain. And it was a two-word answer. Tony Pandy was one incident where Churchill was accused of abusive force. Mm -hmm. The correct answer should have been Churchill, hero or villain? Both. Yes. I would have said yes, because it's yeah. funnier, but either yeah. way. Okay. So there are two different perspectives, both of which are held very passionately. One says he was a great leader who inspired a nation in its darkest hour. Right. This, of course, was a... Uh award-winning film that came out, what, two years ago? Mm -hmm. 
Best picture. Called best the actor. Tiger. Yes. Our I like that movie. Gary Oldman. I like that movie. I like that movie much better than the other movie that had something to do with uh, 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 Churchill that came out at that time, and that was Dunkirk. I didn't like that movie very much. Ah, it was I a weird movie. It, a lot of people loved it. Way too weird. <laughs> I was halfway through it before I realized they were telling the same story from five different viewpoints, and it's like. I was totally confused. All right, but that's that's a taste sure. issue. That's different. Um, just technically, the the beautiful shots of the of the film and oh, it, I, I, beautiful, okay. yes. But okay. it was weird storytelling. Okay, so uh, as we say, you know, other people say that he was an imperialist, racist, and caused millions of deaths. These two positions are not mutually exclusive. Nope. Not caused in a, millions of deaths is, of course, a loaded phrase. Sure, uh, but not in a very complex man such as Winston Churchill. Not in most of us can't do not have uh, the capability of being in the kind of place Churchill was for as long as Churchill was. He was part of the very elite of Great Britain. He was a member of parliament for 64 years. 64 years. <laughs> and he was prime minister twice. And... He fulfilled all sorts of other jobs. Oh, a whole string of jobs. Yeah. We might try to list them, we might not. Yeah, it, because it's exhaustive. Three of them, at least, he was grotesquely incompetent for. And, That's not controversial. Yes, and because he admits to at least one one of those jobs he was completely inadequate at. And he was fired from it. Anyway, let's, let's move on. I want to start with real hardcore history. Right. And one of the things... Everybody in this planet, and we're going to hopefully get to some clips with mm -hmm. people arguing about history who aren't historians. Right. And you can read history. You can know a lot of history. You can be an expert on history. But there are certain things that historians tend to know right. um, and they use. And one of them involves the two definitions here. Right. Two words we're going to talk about. The first one is historiography. Historiography. Um, that when sounds. I first, that's history and geography in yes, one. It's no, two classes in one. No, it's not actually about geography at all. Historiography. Uh, when I I had to take uh, at least two classes in historiography. When I first started my graduate studies in history, I thought it was the dumbest thing in the world because, as is explained, as it's defined, it is about the writing of history, historiography, uh, and. That just seems like totally. Well, so wait, wait, we're studying how you write history. Yes, exactly. first one thing happens, then, then something, something else. else. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but after taking taking the classes and reading more into it, uh, historians look at this very carefully because it is a way to look at what has been written, a way to search through and understand the existing literature and a way to understand how other historians have told the story because it that can affect the story they tell. Edmund Gibbons in writing The Fall, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Or was the history of the, history history of the decline, decline and fall, fall of the Roman, of the Roman Empire. Empire. Thank you. It's a million, 1.1 million words. <laughs> but he is writing it at a time before scientific history. He's using some uh, primary sources, but he comes to some very weird conclusions. By now the way, that's foreshadowing. We're going to yeah. be mentioning Gibbon later. Yeah. But it's not unusual for two historians to look at the exact same data and come to very, very different conclusions. That's why historians say we are informed by the scientific method, but we don't follow it. Because ideally, if you're doing experiments, and they never let us historians do experiments anymore. Really? You can't see? How, how would a how bullet have gone into yeah. Lincoln's head from that right, balcony? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they don't let us do do experiments, so we can't test our ideas. So um, we can't really say history is a science, but we do try to follow the scientific method with what we do. But understanding that if you're talking about a historian who is maybe writing about the uh, 12th century Islamic culture, and this historian cannot read Arabic, or any of the other languages that the Islamic cultures uh, wrote and left behind their literature in, that probably means that he's doing his research, he or she is doing their research in languages that they might know, like English 
or other Romance languages, which means that you're reading stuff from the people who actually fought against the Islamic Empire. So you might gonna, have bias sources. Yeah, yes. that's going to really okay. change, there change your so, sources. Two things. One, this is a very good way to make really interesting stories of history really boring. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Number two is that there are so many ways to look at a scene that right. you can say, well, the soldiers came over the hill, or you can say, well, the other side was way. There's, there's just a million ways to look at something. Because quite honestly, my studies, my uh, undergraduate studies in theater and theater criticism helped me a lot more in history than you can ever imagine. Okay, the other term I want to talk about, which sounds similar and is very different, is hagiography. Hagiography is the science that studies old witches. No, um, no, not hag. Oh, hagiography. Oh, sorry. Hagiography comes from the Greek, meaning basically writing about, about holiness. Right. See? So hagiography was the writing of saints. A hagiographic work is basically, originally was a story mm -hmm. about the lives of saints. Right. Today, it's used to mean something which is basically glossing over. Right. It's it's trying to so show. So perfect. Right. Trying to show a person in their best light. And much of the literature on Churchill is hagiographic. Right. A you, lot you of sources to, out there. But but for Churchill, uh, generally speaking, they're, they're creating these hagiographies not by lying. They're telling the truth. It just isn't the whole truth. So hopefully... Okay, I'm going to give you we'll an example real quickly sure. about Mr. Go Churchill. Okay, about basically it's about historiography, how it's written, and how hagiography, the desire to spin things well. Right. Churchill is said by some to have had a drinking habit. Hitler described him as an alcoholic continuously lush. Okay? Yep. I have read sites that say he didn't drink that much. He actually usually only drank with meals. Right. With meals. He but what meals? Breakfast. breakfast? Yes. He had two glasses of sherry with breakfast. Here's a quote that I, I love from Churchill about he was meeting with King Saud in number 10 Downing Street in England right. and was told you can't have any alcohol in the room when the King of Saudi Arabia is there, right. to which he said, <clears throat> excuse me, I must point out that my rule of life prescribed by an absolutely sacred right of smoking cigars and also the drinking of alcohol before, after, and if need be, during all meals and in the intervals between them. He could write. <laughs> he could write. He could write beautifully. Uh, I, by the way, I'd like to comment on a comment from uh, Uvas out there, which is, ma'am, if I was your husband, I would eat the mushrooms. That's from the old saying that uh, supposedly Lady Astor. Lady Astor says, if I was your husband, I would, if I, if you were my husband, husband I, I'd, I'd poison your coffee. And Winston Churchill supposedly said, madam, if you were my wife, I would drink it. Unfortunately, Somebody has found that that existed in a joke book written in the mid-19th century, so that was probably misattributed. Sorry. Right. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of quotes misattributed to Winston Churchill. So uh, be really careful when you see somebody saying, oh, Churchill said this. Would you all tab me, please? Yeah, be happy to. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about what is fact, mm -hmm. what is supposition, what is... Are we going to get in the controversy? The controversy? You want me to play a video? I was going to play fact or opinion. Oh, cool. Okay. If I can find it here. Yes, we have a game show. Well, not yet we don't. I need you to hit tab for me again. I'm sorry. We're... Never mind. I could explain all this, what? but why should I? What do you want me to hit? Hang on here. <laughs> Talk to these people about controversies for a second while I find this clip. Okay, actually, um, what about if I talk about heroes? Uh, you can talk about heroes, or if you like, we can play. We, we can play. You know, we need to hire a technical director. Put it in the budget. We need to play fact or opinion. Bum, bum, bum. All right, question number one. Churchill saved Britain in its darkest hour. This is recited everywhere. Mm -hmm. Fact or opinion? Wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay. You gotta let you gotta let, let, let the audience join. At home. I think it's opinion. Now, I think I, I happen to agree with it, but I still think it's an opinion because mm -hmm. we don't know what would have happened if somebody else had been there. We don't know these other factors. We've got one set of data points. Exactly. So, even though I think it's probably true, 
it's still opinion. Okay. Churchill's nations inspired the nation throughout World War II. Fact. You didn't. Anyway. Did I have a test spelling error in there? Yep. I say that's a fact. Definitely a fact. Oh, the yeah. speeches were moving. They were incredible. Yep. Um, just good stuff about, uh, well, we will fight them in the land. We will fight them in the sea. And he knew how to do this. One of the reasons when he received his Nobel Prize, it said for oratory. Yes. Um, because it was it included not only the ability to write, but the ability to say things. Okay, this is a big controversial one, and this is the point of a lot of arguments today. Mm -hmm. Churchill was responsible for the deaths of millions during the Bengal famine of, of 1943. Now, I say, people may disagree with this. I say, that's an opinion. Yeah. Millions of people died in the Bengal famine of 1943. Unquestionably, Churchill could have done things differently unless people would have died. Right. But whether or not Churchill was personally responsible, I say that's an opinion. Um. Churchill, we're going to, as we find out, um, often committed sins of omission. They were basically he failed to do something or he didn't do something, and consequently, bad things happen. Okay. Can I jump in here? Go for we've it. got another one from uh, Puff Love, I guess, that says, What about the uh, one about I'll be sober? That one, according to this story, <laughs> there is yeah. an eyewitness for. Yes. But allegedly, Churchill was at a conversation and a woman, it was not Lady Savoy, although it is sometimes quoted, that right. said, sir, you are drunk. You are disgustingly drunk. Yes. To which he said, madam, I am drunk and you are ugly, but I will be sober so in the morning. There is an eyewitness who insists that one happened. Um, it's still a little unusual because most of Churchill's really good writing to me was a little longer, not as pithy. Right. I mean, he did but, describe one opponent as a sheep in sheep's clothing. That's right. also pithy. That's pithy. He also at one point was making a, a, a presentation in Parliament, and as he's talking, one of the backbenchers was yelling at him, liar, 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 to which at one point Churchill stopped his speech and said, if the gentleman in the back bench would introduce himself with his name, rather than continually stating his uh, profession, maybe we could be, you know, mutually well acquainted. <laughs> this is like, what? Anyway, so. Uh, shall we talk about this one? Okay, go for it. Okay. Churchill understood the dangers of Nazis before other British leaders. Hmm. When you're showing him up against Neville Chamberlain? who was appeasing Nazis, when you're talking about other people, especially those people who had been through World War I and they didn't want to go through another war, you can uh, understand the, the thrust of let's just appease Hitler and not have a war. Okay. This is one where it's tough because Churchill certainly understood the dangers of Nazis before most other British leaders. To say that he understood them before all other British leaders, that's a little tougher. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm not going to actually post an answer on that. Sure. Because he Go clearly understood it before others. How about this one? And this is, now we're going to start to upset people, mm -hmm. the uh, Church of Files. And I can see we've got people here who have read a lot. Yep. <laughs> we're in trouble. Churchill campaigned for and helped orchestrate the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Iran. We gotta give give him a break. Give, give him a break. Him, we give, haven't give, set no, up. No, no, give give him a chance. Give we haven't chance. set up any response mechanisms. I, well, ding ding ding. We've, we've got Uvas. Is okay. Trying to type. Uvas in. is going to type something. Okay. Fact. Uh, trying to type in thing. Going to give him give him a second. All right. This is there on a delay. Oh, okay. Yep. Uvas says fact. It is a fact. Yay! We have his signature on the document authorizing it. This is a really ugly issue. It's called. Uh, Operation Ajax. The British didn't actually call it Operation Ajax. That was the American thing. And to be clear, the Americans did it. Right. The British the orchestrated it and asked for it, but the Americans did the dirty work. The Americans right. organized and paid off people. And uh, that, of course, came out in 2013. Mm -hmm. There was a, uh, the, the federal government declassified certain documents. Yep. Churchill's warnings helped stop the spread of global communism. Mm. Actually, I'm not sure that I agree with what I've got down here as an answer the more I think about it. Yep. Because I'll probably fight you for it. Well, here's the thing. We say stopped the spread of global communism. Mm -hmm. 
That is an opinion. If we say helped stop the spread of global communism, that is probably a fact. It's a minor distinction. Yeah. But ultimately... But meaningful. Meaningful, okay. Especially because uh, even though Churchill had spoken out against communism and wanted it contained, uh, at the moment he was speaking out, that was already American policy. Containment was already American policy. Um, he mobilized, and this is mm -hmm. <laughs> beyond the scope of this presentation, but it's still interesting. He mobilized American thought when the majority of American, this is a speech made in America, right. when the majority of Americans still thought the Russians were our allies. Yes. He switched that. So I would say he definitely contributed to the okay. attitude towards containment, but to say he stopped it. Right. So how about this one? This one is word as such that I think the answer is obvious. Uh, Churchill once thought Benito Mussolini was a great hero. Mm. Mm. Oh. Do we have any responses? Shall I jump on it? Do we have a response? Oh. Oh. Lawrence Dillon says facts. Well, Lawrence Dillon is correct. Ding, 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 ding. Now, for the record, he changed his opinion later as they got closer to war, but he did... He did, uh, basically, Mussolini was a horrible, horrible person, but he wasn't mm -hmm. Hitler. And he basically... <laughs> <laughs> Only Hitler was Hitler. That's true. <laughs> God went alert. But he did, uh, <laughs> he did reverse it, but he basically thought that Mussolini would stop the spread of communism. And this is early on, like 10 years before the start of World well, War yeah, II. Well, yeah, because Mus yeah, Mussolini had, had created his fascist government in... in 1923. And he was originally democratically elected, then he suspended elections, no, which wasn't. is beyond the scope. We're not going to argue this because it's beyond the scope of this paper, this presentation, this paper. Okay. How about this one? Churchill was prejudiced against Muslims and Hindus. Um, are we actually going to wait for response or can I just go? All right. Well, the answer, that's clearly a fact. I've got yeah. some quotes here that basically, um, now I know that- No, Uvas has got it. In America, many people still have these attitudes, but he basically said, it's on page one, where's page one? I don't know. I've got this quote I was going to read here. Um, It is evident that Christianity, however degraded and distorted by cruelty and intolerance, must always exert a modifying influence on men's passions and protect them from the more violent forms of fanatical fever. But the Mohammedan religion increases instead of lessening the fury of intolerance. Mm -hmm. That was in 1898. Now, it was kind of the classic thing. He was a kid who grew up in luxury right. in England, mm -hmm. private schools, and was suddenly face-to-face -face fighting against soldiers who are Muslims, and yep. they didn't have the decorum. Yep. Okay, here's one that we are may, I'm going to actually leave up for answer because this is a curious one. Churchill was happy when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. I've heard that story many times. One yes. said that he actually, actually danced around his office. Do you actually know the answer to this? No. Okay. Do you? Yes. Oh, okay. He actually commented on this allegation late in his life. Bud says opinion. Okay. I believe Uvas's fact it was for the last one. Okay. Fact because it meant the USA would join World War One. Uvas says fact. So I want to invite Fafalopikas to come and give this presentation. Yeah. He's right. Okay. <laughs> Get over here. The quote is I my, oh, hang on. Do, 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 do. That's the wrong page. Oh dear. I had it all pulled out. Anyway, he basically said, I will confess that I was overjoyed because it meant the end of Hitler. Yep. And this is part of the way Churchill fought, honestly, was that the ends justify the means. And actually, Puffalopagus uh pointed out, did Churchill actually tell the reporter that America will always do the right thing once they've exhausted all of their options in response to her asking if we would join World War II? So yeah, that that's fits in nicely with, with, with the ideas that Churchill was pretty happy with the uh, America's, Americans um, joining World War II. All right. Um, okay. How about this one? I wish we're taking too long on this. This is not in the schedule, but it's fun. Churchill was anti-Semitic. 
By the way, this is a trick question. Mm -hmm. The answer is, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, Churchill was a huge champion of the state of Israel. Right. He um, passionately he was, believed He was that, a Zionist, but he was somewhat anti-Semitic. Um, not necessarily. He had friends who were Jewish. They were powerful friends. He fought, thought that Jewish immigration should be maintained in Israel. The issue is that he believed in the... The reason why I say it's complicated is he did believe that there was an international Jewish conspiracy. Okay. Right. The movement among Jews is not news. This worldwide conspiracy to overthrow civilization and for the reconstruction of society on the basis of arrested development of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. Mm -hmm. He was referring to the Bolsheviks, yeah. who basically he felt were disproportionately Jewish, um, which I'm not really sure. Not really. <laughs> um, okay, we need to keep moving on. Um, so I'm going to skip forward. Um, this is a quote which I'm going to reference in a minute, but this is one that came originally from Shasha Thrandur. Churchill has as much ha blood on his hands as Hitler. Shasha Thrandur is an Indian politician, and I'm going to play a clip of him later. If we get to it, we're running way behind on time. But, and as I said, this is another trick question because we're near the end of the stack. That's balderdash, okay? <laughs> That's not opinion. That's not a fact. That's balderdash. And I want to emphasize this really hard. Yeah. Churchill was not Hitler. No. Hitler killed people deliberately. He Churchill was... took harsh actions, ruthless actions that killed people that should not have been killed. Right. He organized invasions of Ireland. He's hired thugs to go and burn down villages in Ireland. Right. Well, he didn't necessarily tell them to burn, but he should have been in control of them. Right. But he did not mm -hmm. say, go kill a bunch of people. Although he, he, did, he did do Hitler one better because he did claim to have shot three people during the Boer War, personally. Oh, I didn't know that story. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so. Uh, you need me to click um, can I, I'm going to want to actually want to play a couple of video clips. And this is basically because, and these are, I want to talk about, um, can you uh, actually? What? We're going to play the other one. Well, we'll play this one. Actually, nope, that's the button I want. There. Well, uh um, this is Shashi Tharoor, who is a leading Indian politician. And, he published, and intellectual. He's quite intelligent. So we're going to take a look at this real quick, if I can get this to work. Well, um, I certainly think Mr. Churchill needs very severe re-examination. Uh, he has as much blood on his hands as Hitler does. And um, particularly the decisions that he personally signed off on during the so-called uh, Great Bengal Famine of 1943-44, when 4.3 million people died because of decisions that he took or endorsed um, remains a permanent stain as far as I'm concerned. Uh, because not only did the British pursue their old policy of not helping victims of, of, of this famine, which they had been created by their policies, but Churchill persisted in exporting grain from Bengal to Europe, not to feed actual sturdy Tommies, to use his phrase, but to add to the buffer stocks that were being piled up in the event of a future invasion of Greece or Yugoslavia. Ships laden with wheat were coming in from Australia, docking at Calcutta, and were instructed by Churchill not to disembark, but to, save on to sail on to Europe. And when conscience-stricken British officials from Calcutta wrote to the Prime Minister in London, pointing out that his policies were causing needless loss of life, all he could do was write peevishly in the margin of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? And this is the man whom the British persist in hailing as some sort of apostle of freedom and democracy, when to my mind, he is uh, really one of the more evil rulers of the 20th century, uh, only fit to stand in the company of the likes of Hitler, Mao, and Stalin. Indians are all too quick to forgive and forget. I have no problem with forgiving. We okay. should forgive. But I think it's important that we not forget. Oops. Oops. We're back. Okay. Okay. Comment? <laughs> yeah. Um, I will say Sashi Thanur. Thanur. Um, 
is I not certainly... a historian. He is uh, studied. He has, he has a, a doctorate, a PhD in uh, political science. No, international relations. International relations. Shashi yeah. Tharoor was voted on and was expected to become the Secretary General of the United Nations, but right. one member of the Security Council voted to block that. Right. John Bolton. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they went with Ban Ki Moon instead. Right. But the point is. I'm, I'm saying that just to say this is not just some wacko Indian with an axe to grind. He is right. a very eloquent speaker, very charismatic politician, mm -hmm. um, and he makes some very strong points right. there. Well, what's what's most important to understand is that uh, before recently we had the Should voices Winston of Churchill Westerners talking about Churchill, both bad and good. Now we are having and seeing the voices of the people from the former colonies who are now able to talk to re to do the research and talk about this and it brings a really different sort of understanding to what's going on and also uh Inglorious Empire Sashi Thuror's book is a bestseller yeah it's very but now i want to take a look at the response and this is some a couple of clips from british television of the kind of response that comes to this and a few other right. things. Um, and, well, you're going to see a reference to Afua Hirsch, who's a uh, mm -hmm. British person of right. African ancestry who made a documentary called Battle for Britain's Heroes, where she right. basically questions these things. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick look at this. Winston Churchill have his statue. Would yes, you take I, that I, down? I would like to hear a debate about Winston Churchill yeah. because three million people died unnecessarily. My God, from we'll a take down Winston Churchill's statue. Trisha, because, what do you think I mean, about Trisha Winston Goddard, Churchill? Let's take down Winston Churchill's wow. statue. Apparently, I think we should be. They're not talking about Trisha. I Admiral think we Lord should be Nelson. educating people about the full story. Let me educate people about Lord Nelson and, and Winston well, Churchill. They saved this nation. One from Napoleon. One from the Nazis. Damn right they get statues. And to try and pretend somehow they're now these ghastly people who should have their statues ripped down is deeply offensive to most people in this country. I'm not uh. saying we should necessarily bring them down. Take a deep breath, everyone. You did but originally. all options should be on the table. As the global movement to re-question our so-called oui. heroes shows, the thing that's clear is this. Doing nothing, burying our heads in the sand, and hoping this debate will go away is simply no longer an option. And I don't think it's uh, anyone here is suggesting that we remove references to that in history. I think the question is, when looking at historical figures, uh, what we're celebrating about them, for example, if they happen to have saved our very civilization, then there may be something worth celebrating for. What for? The, po the point is, is that this is where we are. This is how we have got to the point we are. We yeah. can't go back and exactly. delete and correct yeah. Yeah. according to today's saying, norms and today's morals exactly. and today's thinking. That is the opposite yeah. of what I'm the saying, is, though. No, you, you're not. You're, you're saying that we have to make the past appropriate I'm not to the present. That is the opposite we can of never what I'm do that. The absolute opposite. Yes, you are, because no, you're saying we must saying. question the fact that no. we are putting on a pedestal, what the men I'm that I now, we now find no, reprehensible. And the <laughs> I am as liberal as the next man. I find this deeply upsetting and also almost insulting. That's because it you is. misunderstand No, what I'm, I'm not. And I fear that you're taking <clears throat> this country down the path of when ISIS goes into Palmyra and knocks down temples, goes through rampages yeah, through right. museums yeah, or like Mosul. What, or like because, what Britain did in the because, empire, destroying no, people's statues and histories and palaces. You cannot decide just because a culture has some unwelcome baggage that you dump the baggage because yeah. it's no longer yeah. useful on your yeah. journey. Can I we now? have yeah. the baggage. Can I speak now? I want to say something. Right. First of all, I'm not saying, and I said clean my intro, we should necessarily take them down. This is what I want, a debate. And the reason I want that is because we don't Leading have it, where? Rachel. And the, re you know, the reason this is not a... I am the opposite of trying to erase our history. I want us to know our history. So when we look at Churchill, I would like people to know about using aerial policing in Mesopotamia and not distinguishing between civilians. And I would like people to know about three to four what million about, people what, dying. What about the as things well, really famous As well for, as winning Like defeating Hitler. Exactly. Like saving, Which yeah. already like like saving Western democracy. Like saving Okay, um, yeah. So one of the reasons why I wanted to include that clip, and there was so much on there, is the passion that you get. Mm -hmm. Now, Piers Morgan, people who know who he is, he's quite mm -hmm. the blowhard. He gets very upset. Mm -hmm. The second clip was from a debate show, which airs on right. Sky TV, which is a Rupert Murdoch-owned property yep. in the United Kingdom. 
But what I found fascinating was the people white splaining. <laughs> not, not only white splaining, but none of them are historians. None of them are historians, but getting so passionate that she's basically telling the woman what she thinks. Yeah. Um, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, here's what you're saying. Yes. Um, excuse me. I think I should get to say what I'm saying. Maybe I'm just weird that and, way. And and knowing that that so many British people that I've known are very calm and measured individuals, and to see them screaming at each other across the table is, wow. over this issue. And part of it is they're not willing to consider. And this yeah. is what I'm, I'm most fascinated by about the story. They're not willing to consider that there's another side. Sure. You know, they've got this guy as a hero. So let's talk about how would you evaluate a guy mm -hmm. like Winston Churchill? You know, we could make a score sheet. Yay. This many good, this many yeah. bad. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, oh, six good, but only five bad. He's right. a winner. Okay, that's bunk of body count. It's not a contest. You know, Hitler killed 20 million yeah. people. <laughs> Stalin killed 30 million people. Okay, then there's something that I call the snitch catch. Yep. If you do something so good that it overcomes all of the bad, and this is... The golden snitch from Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yes. Did he catch the snitch by defeating the Nazis? No. Now, I don't have to answer this, mm -hmm. but I do want to say how we evaluate this, you know. Certainly, if he were running for office today, mm -hmm. he would be out of there for any number of things. And we haven't had time to go into the controversies over the right. Irish, the South Africans, women's suffrage. Um, <laughs> it's a long list of issues that he was on the wrong yeah. side of. The fact that he was probably responsible for Gallipoli. You right. know, the fact that he instituted a policy against the advice of the best economist in the world at the time right. and plunged Britain into a devastating depression, right. which may have even led to the global depression of the late 1920s, early 1930s. Right. These are bad things, yeah. but he did defeat Hitler. He did defeat Hitler. Well, so. Hitler killed Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so is it a snitch catch? Does, um, Does one grand gesture overcome everything? Or do we have a zero tolerance attitude? He was a racist, we're done. Yeah. You know, he overthrew a democratically elected government in Iran. We're done. We're done. Okay. These are our big questions. You know, the political agenda of each side, everybody arguing has an ax to grind. We're going right. to get to that in a minute. But first, I was going to look at the score sheet. <laughs> um, you've been reading too many British sources. You've spelled labor with a U. Well, all right. So I did. So we copied it, actually. Um, you know, um, but account is, is it's 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 silly i mean you know? yeah. and one of the things that we have to accept is sometimes good people do bad things sometimes bad people do good things mm -hmm. and sometimes good people do bad things right in the middle of doing something good this is winston churchill you know um by the way i tried these sometimes good people do bad things mm -hmm. doesn't get you out of trouble with her mm -mm. <laughs> Anyway. So can we talk about who are the people defending him? Obviously, sure. Piers Morgan. Uh, Obviously, Piers Morgan. Uh, uh, Winston Churchill is a favorite of conservatives, of the right. For reasons just, that aren't entirely clear, because he favored workplace reforms. Well, I'm going well, to talk about, I'm going to talk about in a few moments, uh, the idea of the hero and why they would be so positive about him. Okay. So... There's the International Churchill Society. If you were to uh, search YouTube for, uh, I did it this afternoon, you search YouTube for history, for documentaries on Churchill, the first thing that's going to pop up, the paid one, is a documentary on Churchill by the International Churchill Society. They are hagiographers. Hey, yes. They claim they're not, but they basically, yeah. one of the things, again, they say, well, he didn't drink that much. Right. Yes, he did. They, they, they don't talk about the really bad stuff, the semi-bad stuff they put a spin on. Right. And again, and this is and this is what you have to be aware of. This is why you want to to, you know, look at who's saying this is all part of historiography. The British public are very uh pro Churchill. Uh there's a big statue of him right outside of parliament. Mm -hmm. And several others. Um, yep. But the, there's a growing population of people from Britain, if you haven't been there lately, is mm -hmm. actually fairly diverse now. There's ethnically diverse, especially in the urban areas. Right. And London has a Muslim mayor right. who, when asked whether Churchill was a hero or a villain, 
beautifully skated around the issue. I yep. mean, it was Sonia Henning stuff, okay? Yep. <laughs> okay? So the Churchill Archive, of course, because they've got his papers. Now, I don't know if the archive actually publishes stuff. There's, There's a, a website for Churchill Archive, and you'll find a lot of stuff there. Okay, I don't know but, about but, printed materials. But the question is, is it, a, is it an online digital archive? Is it an old-fashioned paper archive? And generally speaking, archives do not put out material. So this is something you always have to look at. Who's actually putting out material as opposed to who's just a uh, repository? Okay. Again, we talked about the conservative media, Prager right. University. Prager University. And uh, there's this guy. Which guy? This guy. He's supposed to pop on screen. It's not working. Nope. We just hit a snag. There it is. This guy. He's the British right-wing demagogue with funny hair. Yes. This is Mr. Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson wrote a biography recently called The Churchill Factory, and it, Churchill Factor, it yep. sold a lot, not that much, but it was interesting because he pushes nationalism. Boris Johnson is one of the leading voices behind Brexit. Brexit. He was a successful writer and columnist. Mm -hmm. Boris Johnson said a number of things in promoting Brexit simply weren't true. Exactly. So he's really got some issues, but he wrote this book about Churchill, mm -hmm. which created a sense of nationalism because mm -hmm. Churchill's a national hero. And right. I hope you'll talk about that more oh, yeah. in a minute. Yeah. So Churchill making him a national hero, trying to create a Britain for British kind of attitude, mm -hmm. which is interesting because Churchill was a passionate supporter of the European Union. Right. He said, we need to create a United States of Europe. What you so, guys are doing so, here with this big free yeah. trade block with everybody together, that's working. Yeah, so, so definitely Boris Johnson using Churchill to uh, speak against the European Union is going against what Churchill actually wrote about. Boris Johnson being liberal with the truth? <sighs> Loose with the truth? Yes. Okay. Um, I, wanted, I mentioned on this slide here a group called Hillsdale College. Hillsdale mm -hmm. College is a, a private Christian right-wing college up in northern Wisconsin, and they publish the Churchill Center and a lot of materials, and you will find that Edits on the Wikipedia page of Churchill come from him. Again, anytime you type Churchill, you will get references to the Hillsdale College Churchill Center. Mm -hmm. um, Hillsdale College is a school which does not allow its students to receive federal student loans. Right. Because in order to do that, they would have to report their ethnic breakdown, and they're not willing to do that. Right. Now, they have a history. They were actually part of the abolition movement at one point, so they say they're not racist. I don't need to go into there. I yeah. don't need to... I mean, Hollywood, of course. Hollywood. Hollywood, yeah. Hollywood loves a hero who's an unlikely hero, yeah. who's a short, pudgy little man who makes great speeches. Right. Very un-Hollywood. But it was it was a good well, they, film. They like the underdog. Yeah. And, and there have been other stories about Churchill. He's, sure. he's a background figure. And... When you're doing Hollywood, you usually have good guys and bad guys. Right. And in World War II movies, we know who the bad guys are. Yep. That, that part is taken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's very easy to, to figure out who's right and who's wrong. And, of course, one of the people who is the most responsible for putting forward a good image of Winston Churchill is... Winston, Winston Churchill. Churchill. <laughs> because he was an exemplary and eloquent writer. And he will say about his himself and history. Go for it, Jerry. Uh, keep talking. He will say about himself and history is that history, I'm paraphrasing, history will be kind to Churchill or be kind history to me. History will be kind to me. Because I intend to write it. Churchill actually did write quite a few uh, volumes of history, uh, generally the history of the British speaking people. Uh, and that's partly one of the reasons that was listed that he won the Nobel Peace Prize, a Nobel Prize for Literature. A Nobel Prize for Literature. He did not win a Peace Prize. No. Um, he would be hard pressed to because Churchill's prosecution of the war was pretty violent. And one of the questions we have is a cartoon. I one of the questions that, you know, n is not resolved is, did he need to be as violent as he was? Okay, the picture of Winston Spencer Churchill, the famous war correspondent. Um, this is, again, way back in the 1890s, he was writing books about his adventures. He was uh, not a soldier at the time. He was actually a journalist when he was 
taken prisoner of war in South right. Africa by the Boers and escaped after three months. It's a yeah. good adventure story. And he wrote it up. And it, he wrote it up. It's it was really quite it exciting. sold newspapers. Yeah. He was very famous. Mm -hmm. So he helped create the myth of Winston Churchill. Okay, major attackers. Um, yep. These we've kind of talked about, so we don't need to spend much time on them. Right. Um, Shashi Tharoor, as we already mentioned, Afua Hirsch we mentioned, John McDonald, Shadow Chancellor. A lot of YouTube commentators and some scholarly historians are taking this position, but it's not mainstream, which mm -hmm. is somewhat curious right. that the passionate defenders, you know, you can go out and say, I've made another documentary, I've written another book about how great Churchill was. Right. There's a market for it. Yes. Um, yeah. There's, yeah, there's... Con Cons there's considerable passion on both sides, but you don't find it too often in terms of actual historians uh, who are, you know, doing the heavy lifting and going ahead and and, and writing. And they understand historiography because he did this, but he also did this. It's but, not going to work. But they they don't. They're not all excited, so they don't sell newspapers or so whatever. Why are people so passionate? This is what we're looking at, you know, and. Indians, as, as one commentator said, do not have a high opinion of Churchill. Nope. Welsh people do not have a high nope. Irish people don't have a high opinion of Churchill. Australians are pretty negative yep. because, of, because of Gallipoli. Because of Gallipoli, the, the Australians and the New Zealand okay. uh, uh, military. Americans adore Churchill. Americans adore Churchill, but he's hated on several other continents. Well, yeah, India, <laughs> Pakistan, Kenya, and we haven't talked about Kenya, the... Atrocities against the Mau Mau's were so bad. And this is an issue where just because we're going to eventually get some commentators on our YouTube feed, I'm sure, saying, well, he was a great man. How could you do this? You're shills. The atrocities committed during his administration, whether he was responsible or not, is questionable. I kind of maintain the buck stops at the top. Right. But the British government has accepted responsibility for the atrocities committed in Kenya, and right. they have paid reparations. That happened about five years ago. Right. So that's so that's so kind that's, of a case closed. That's kind of a case closed there. Yeah. Um, so, but let's talk a little bit more about what excites the passion, because I'm not sure Churchill would appreciate a hagiography. Hey, no. He tended to say, "I like being disagreed with. I relish the debate. I relish the controversy." Yeah. He and was. He was a. He was a. Uh, he a was fighter, a, a fighter, not not a boxer. Went to military school, yes. yeah. But he he believed in he believed in the fight. He believed in competition, and and he uh, said he relished the sounds of bullets going overhead. Oh yes, that's actually he said. There's nothing so exhilarating as to be shot at with ill effect. <laughs> <laughs> Churchill, of course, doesn't care what you think about him. So the idea of we need to honor Churchill because of all he did for us. Churchill doesn't care. That's kind of going nowhere. Yeah. Um, Churchill is not paying. If you believe in an afterlife, Churchill still isn't paying attention to what you think about him. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a non-starter. But people yeah. certain seem to feel obligated to build more statues, to have more respect. Right. Other people say, well, we want to inspire our youth mm -hmm. to drink more. To <laughs> yeah. No, this is a problem when you create a monument. Is are you trying to celebrate the whole person or one achievement? Well, let me, let me, I want to talk about, can I? Get Go in ahead. here and talk about waiting. nationalism. Okay, thank you. Nationalism. Now, you wrote a master's thesis on nationalism. Yeah, I wrote a I wrote my master's thesis on appropriating icons about a particular Russian hero by the name of Alexander Nevsky. Uh, and I wrote about how he, Nevsky was alive during the 13th century, but he pops up in Russian history again and again and again as a symbol of this great hero. But every time he pops up, it's just his, 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 uh, he's just slightly different. Redrawn. He's just slightly totally redrawn. Um, and, and to whatever effect is nest is needed by the people doing the artwork. So I want to talk just very briefly about what do we mean by a hero? There's a couple of different definitions of uh, what? Sorry, go ahead. Okay. okay. There's a couple of different definitions. There's the mythological hero. Uh, this is the great man goes on an epic journey and he comes back changed. I like my heroes on whole wheat with yeah. avocado. And, and this is, and this is the Joseph Campbell hero with a thousand faces. And we're, you know, Luke Skywalker uh, in the fourth, the first fourth film. Anyway, the, but this idea of the epic journey and he goes on all these adventures. So that's the mythic 
hero. That's not what we're talking about. There's the literary hero. There's the hero as the protagonist in a tragedy, who is a mortal man who pridefully wishes to go against fate and the gods and is brought down low by his own pride. This is the sin of hubris. This is Greek tragedy. Uh, for more information, see Aristotle's Poetics, where he lays it all out. This is what happens in Act 1, happens in Act 2, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's still not what we're talking about, because our modern people, we want to have pride. Pride is not um, the same to us as it was to the Greeks. Then there's the sacred hero, the believer who is persecuted and willingly killed for the sake of the religion slash church, a saint, a martyr, or a holy person. Lincoln? Still, well, yeah, Lincoln's going to fulfill that role, but not totally. But um, reading various uh, authors, various historians, uh, particularly Anthony D. Smith on his work on national identity, he contends that when nationalism comes along, and by nationalism we mean both the culture of the people in a territory and the state or the rational state. Since the rise of nationalism, there has been a need for a new type of, per, of, of hero. And one of the uh, ideas that he puts forward is called the civic hero. Uh, he doesn't quite use that term, but he talks about uh, the need for civic virtues. And as he goes through and talks about what would this hero be like, uh, this hero, number one, needs to take the place of the sovereign. That's, you know, pretty obvious. With nationalism, you get rid of the king. The king's no longer on the flag or on the coins or the symbol or the statue. Churchill's on the money. Yeah, but, well, let me... Okay, let me we're good. Okay. It's okay. The, another, um, another aspect of the hero is, the civic hero, is that he supports the nation as a part of our own identity. He has to be part of the national identity, which is really uh, what uh, Anthony D. Smith talks about, is that nationalism is just another piece of our own identity uh, that we, we put on. Uh, the civic hero should be the protector of the homeland, and the homeland is the idea of this piece of property where we all live, and it's only for the initiated. It's only for the people who were born here or naturalized in this keep, place. Keep Britain for the British. Exactly. Uh, number four, he should be part of the patria, the community of laws and institutions with a single political will. So not necessarily of completely of the government, but usually part of the government. And when we talk about the civic hero, we often talk about presidents prime ministers, okay. et cetera. And, a, oh, sorry. And, and a couple more, if I may. All right. Shares common values and traditions with the people in the nation. He should be a moral exemplar of the past. Definitely. Uh, and number six, the, the civic hero should be centered in the golden age of the past, this mythical time that everybody remembers that they most of those people were not there, but they see that time as being much better than right now. Okay. I, she didn't share this with me when we were preparing for the show because that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Because this is uh, the fact that they have to be from a mythical time. This, of right. course, applies to Robert E. Lee. Yes. Who Robert E. Lee is a nationalist hero of the South. Right. And in a mythical time. Which is one of the reasons why we're going to talk, mm -hmm. we're going to do a show later on monuments yeah. and their relationship to society. Right. But one of the things we talked about earlier is almost every modern culture has yeah. a national hero. And Whether it's Nevsky, Abraham Lincoln, Napoleon, the Italians yeah. have Garibaldi, the Mexicans have Juarez, the Indians, of course, Don have Gandhi. Gandhi uh, the people of South America have uh, Simon de Bolivar. And there's, there's only, more. Only one of the people on the list of the people that we mentioned uh, was not, was born or was in power uh, before 1789 and the French Revolution, and that was, of course, Alexander Nevsky. So uh, the civic hero is has got those uh, values and qualities that I talked about, um, but it's, generally speaking, they don't take that mantle on themselves at the time. It's people in the future who are going to put those values on that person. So uh, that 
sense of the golden age and a sense of the shared common values and traditions. Very important. World War II was the moment Britons were all Britons, all unified. This was their finest hour. That, their finest hour, exactly, that they were all part of the same battle and they won. So that golden age means means a lot to that hero. And what I would the point I would like to make about Churchill, because we've we've pointed out a whole bunch of flaws, we've pointed out a lot of the problems. But here's what I would point out about Churchill is that Churchill may not have been the embodiment of all of the qualities that we want to see in this hero, the civic hero, but his rhetoric and his writings restated and codified them for the British people. In other words, it was his pen that was doing, and his orator, his or oration that was doing so much. Now of I have heavy to show lifting. share another Go quote with it. you. I have never accepted what many people have kindly said, namely that I inspired the nation. Their will was resolute and remorseless, and it proved unconquerable. It fell to me to express it, and I found the right. And if I found the right word, you must remember that I have always earned my living by my pen and by my tongue. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is an interesting thing that Churchill is a hero, really for his literary work. Right. And in some ways, this is an artist mm -hmm. being held up on this pedestal. Right. Um, with great civic leaders. Right. Um, oh, we have a, a famous... we have a question as a historian yourself. Have you read and could you comment on his history writing? I have not read that much. I've only read bits and pieces. Okay, I can tell you what uh, Clement Attlee, who Clement Attlee was sort of Churchill's longtime political rival. Right. He was the labor leader. Uh, after uh, World War II, um, they hadn't had an election since 1935. They suspended elections. As we said, Churchill was not an elected leader. The first election, Clement Attlee won. Right. So they were rivals. Um, later in life, they had some respect for each other, but Clement Attlee said his history of the English speaking people should actually have been titled history of things that I find interesting. <laughs> he might've, he might've not gone into the, into the project with the breadth that he intended, but he did have access. They are not regarded as great scholarly works, yeah. but Churchill never went to college. Right. Churchill went to private schools. He actually had a terrible relationship with his parents because right. they kept mailing him off to various boarding schools. Right. But during his early military assignment in India, as many soldiers do, he had a lot of free time on his hand. And he read everything written by Edward Gibbon, the decline, the History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which is a controversial book, and right. she can comment as a historian about that, yeah. but I'm going to go first. Not, not today. I'm going to go first and say Gibbon's work is eloquent. Oh, yeah. He wrote these beautiful sweeping styles. His conclusions were very controversial, partly because he blamed the fall of the Roman Empire on Christianity, which right. was not popular at that time. <laughs> But Edward Gibbon was very much the inspiration for Churchill, and I'm told you can see a lot in them. Right. But they're not held up as scholarly history. They are very good, from what I understand, popular history. Sure. But, of course, they are from a British perspective. They are nationalistic. They are about our people. And he did write a book on the Civil War, which yeah. I've never found, so I don't and think I'm it was sure, successful. And I'm, I'm sure historians of uh, that specialize in that time would poke holes in it. I'm not... I'm not a specialist in Great Britain, and then I'm not a specialist in the past. I'm a specialist in the Cold War. Uh, so I haven't gotten around much to writing what, uh, reading what he has written. And I have to admit, I love well-written history, not just scholarly history, but I was interested in history by reading Barbara Tuckman okay. and all of her books. And, and I she was she, you know, and she she had it, her masters in English, but she was a great writer. When we first did our first historical documentary, yep. and I was handed a stack of scholarly historical books. What is this? I can't go two sentences without another footnote. I got to go back down here. I got to back in here. And and historians don't make sweeping statements. No. It's very frustrating. You yeah. know, um, was China uh, a major power in the early 17th century? Well, it depends on how you define power and who was there and what period and from what perspective. 
they won't, real historians won't give you a straight answer right. on complex questions. No, we never give you a straight answer on complex questions. We don't get too upset about, well, we do sometimes um, if it's in our own field. Uh, but we have, uh, we have an institutionalized uh, group of historians who uh, have long memories and even longer knives. And they will cut you to ribbons if you're not backing your stuff up. And it can lead to real paralysis, uh, trying to write a book and trying to get it right and trying to cover all of your bases, knowing that somebody's going to come along and poke a hole in it. By the way, Sue Ellen asked a very interesting question. Oh, yeah. Will today's technology keep history more factual? Yes, but. Uh, history is going to change a lot. Uh, I see in the future, well, like me, I watch a lot of films. I watch a lot of videos. I watch a lot of these things that uh, other historians would say, oh, you've got to be, you've got to be kidding. But uh, in the future, historians are going to have to learn how to read W-4s and long form tax returns. I want to jump on this because I have a slightly different perspective. Sure. I think that what we're going to see is in the past, especially when you read Middle Ages, there's a shortage of history. There's one account of something. Right. There's, there's two. We, we have too many accounts. accounts. We've got yeah. too much. And as we say, there's different ways of looking at stuff. You know, um, was Churchill a great, inspiring leader? Questionable. Was he a brilliant speaker? Yes. Was, was he, he an a, alcoholic? Yes. Probably. They was, he a, definition. was he a better painter than Hitler? That's a judgment call. That's a judgment call. Um, and it, it's... I don't know. They were both actually quite good. Yeah, surprisingly. Um, yeah. Um, there was actually. Um, and he was. And Churchill was probably a, a better bricklayer than Socrates. So, so I think historians will have to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, he was. Uh, uh, Churchill took up bricklaying late in life and and became a, a master mason. Okay, so the, the the short of it is, historians in the future will have a surplus of information. They have yeah, better tools. They will know exactly what happens. But for example, one of the things, you know, many people talk about Churchill was a significantly good right. painter. One of the things that I didn't know until we started this project was mm -hmm. that he was short. Yeah. Very few of the photographs make him look short. Um, and yet he was by five foot right. six and a half, five foot right. seven. And um, and as as far as as um as far as sources, one of the very first historians of the oh, 19th that's not century. That's, <laughs> that's not him. That's not, not true. Is that's that Lawrence Kitchener? That's Kitchener. That's there Churchill. Yeah. See, this was a picture. He's also rarely shown smiling. Yeah. But uh, that's as close as you get. This is from about 1920. Um, also, you know, there's another fact. So in some ways, I think we have too many facts now. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the facts we didn't talk about was Churchill, when he became prime minister, mm -hmm. was 65 years old. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's people who are retiring years, at that yes, age. Yes, he was 65 years old in when he first became prime minister. When he first became prime minister, he was 72 when he was first elected prime, prime minister. minister. Yeah, he, yeah. And he, I mean, and he lived to be 80. He lived to be 90. Right, and he drank a lot, and he mm -hmm. smoked cigars regularly, and he lived to be 90. Kids, this don't don't do this. Right, um, <laughs> but but as far as as too many facts and and too much information. Uh, one of the earliest historians, a fellow by the name of von Ranke, said that as long as um, when we get enough facts, we will know history as it really was. And modern historians laugh like crazy <laughs> at that because no, 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 von Ranke. Because when you're, he's talking about mainly. Um, uh, primary sources that were written. And of course, nowadays we look at that and say, you're privileging literate people. That was in many times during and world And primary world sources history. are written with an ax to grind, right. with, to appease your king. Yes. If you're writing, paper is expensive or whatever you're writing on is expensive. You're writing and it's going to be read by your overlord, your king. You know, yep. the, this is uh, Shakespeare's histories. Yeah. You know, the two stars look awfully good in Shakespeare's yeah. So this is, this is why historians study historiography so that we don't fall or hopefully fingers crossed don't fall into those pitfalls of of falling for somebody who's written something and you kind of go huh? okay i guess so okay. yeah. now i wanted to wrap this up a little yeah. bit because we were talking about what role does a hero fulfill mm -hmm. and you know the issue if you're going to build a monument to somebody does he have to be perfect should we study the warts and all? Mm -hmm. Should we tear down these things, which we're doing in America? Right. One of the issues we have is 
Bill Cosby did a tremendous amount of good for right. race relations, for young people, for education. Mm -hmm. He was also a rapist. Right. You know, so we kind of like to pretend that he didn't exist. Right. But I think we have to face the fact that there are ugly people around us. And this leads me kind of to what I feel is the conclusion of our story, which is human heroes are going to disappoint. They won't always be rapists. They won't always be racists, but they will always, there are no demigods. Statues are for art. If you want to know history, read a book. If you want a role model, be the role model, look in a mirror. Um, that sounds arrogant, but you're not going to find anybody who's perfect. Try to be the best yeah. person you can be. Yeah. By oh, the dear, way, that sounds like a greeting card. Yeah. And and <laughs> and by the way, that image of the uh, of the statue in front of Big Ben, that's the statue of uh, Churchill. That's there. And from the front, he's kind of the Churchill that we're used to. But from the back, uh, which is the better, of course, the better view of of pardon me of Parliament. He's an old man. He is he is a man who has struggled a lot with and had a lot of pain in his life. So it's it's not a flattering statue, uh, but it does speak to certain aspects of his life. And um, so maybe maybe we can go ahead and say uh, maybe we can we don't have to uh, erect statues that are perfect. Yeah, okay, and that's done increasing. We do have, you know, you know, the the I personally think the statue of Martin Luther King downtown is kind of yeah, I, I don't white marble. No, I don't think it's as pretty as it could be. But yeah. Okay. So the point is though, you're not gonna find a hero. Nope. And it's okay. And to defend them to the death, they're not religious figures. These nope. are these are people who pooped. Yeah. And worse. And worse. Uh <laughs> So be aware of your sources. Okay. Okay. We've got a big question here. Should we build Kiev statues to traitors to our country? Um, that's a show coming up. We are that's planning a show on the dueling monuments of the North mm -hmm. and the South. Yeah. And what they meant. And should we build or keep statues to traitors to our country is part of the issue of, well, Robert E. Lee wasn't a good person in my opinion but he fulfilled some of these heroic needs for right. the forming of the nation of the South, which right. I don't think the South should be a nation. Right. So in that regard, I think it's negative because it's creating a nation state and a national hero right. for people who should be part of our nation and we should be unified rather than separating. Yeah. But the statues that you see of, of Robert E. Lee are perfect. You know, he's, he's looking artistically, beautiful, oh, yeah. artistically perfect and travelers, yeah, travelers looking great there. Um, and maybe that unrealistic view of heroes is, is not healthy. I think that's a very interesting point. We promised to do that show. It's going to be a few weeks away because yeah. we want to go out when it's sunny and get some pictures of monuments yeah. and stick them well, in. Well, yeah. we're around Washington, D.C. We can go shoot a lot. Yeah, because we do that. All right. So I think we're going to say goodnight to all of our fine friends out there. Thank um, you so thank much you, for being especially here. Especially the two of you who gave us likes. You know, the rest of you, well, whatever. <laughs> 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 anyway, we are uh, curtailing a weekly show. Because, well, because you've got finals to grade. Because I've got so many papers to so grade. So we're going to try to go to every other week, I think. Yeah. We're going to try for that, um, but we'll see what still, happens. Still Wednesday. We will put out reminders and announcements of when we've got a show coming and up. And send us notes. Go ahead. We, yep. we actually do read them. So if you think we're doing a crappy job, don't send that note. No, send that note. We can always be better. <laughs> all right. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and all the ships at sea. Good night.